hello and welcome. Thank you for taking some time today for what's going to hopefully, again, spark some discussion for you and shake up some preconceptions on the role of video games and where they fit in high-end visualization of data, storytelling, and policy. All right, I want to set the stage um, with a video here. And if for some reason you're not hearing great sound, just watch for a moment the visuals. That's the most important thing. I am going to share my screen now, and I'm going to share Google Chrome. I am going to share sound and optimize for the video clip. So in this particular one, um, it's about a minute 55. I'll probably play a minute and a half. I want to set the stage for what we're talking about here. This, of all things, is a clip from the Weather Channel in 2019. And it was a little bit of a science fiction piece they did, believe it or not. So I'll set the stage there, and we'll come back and talk about it. Take a look around. It's the year 2100, and a warming planet has forever changed American cities. Here in Charleston, streets are permanently flooded, rendering parts of the city uninhabitable. Climate predictions from decades ago have come to fruition, and unfortunately, humans ignored the warnings. Warnings that are visible now. Look at Norfolk, Virginia where today in 2019, climate change is already having real consequences. Just a steady onshore breeze and a high tide can lead to flooded roads and homes. It's even led to extensive delays in Navy ship repairs. Over the past 100 years, seas here have risen around one and a half feet, partly because of what's happening thousands of miles away, where the warning signs are the largest, the Arctic, the fastest warming area on Earth. Changes here are drastic, undeniable, and all too real. This Greenland glacier is known as Jakobshavn. It's actually grown a bit in the past two years, but the long-term trend tells a different story. Take a look at this same glacier going back about 150 years ago. What you're watching is over 25 miles of ice, piled thousands of feet high. Scientists have been studying this glacier for decades, and whoa, that was a lot of ice that was there in 1851, that is no longer there today. All right, I wanna stop there for a moment and I will submit to you, that was a numbers report. That was a report that could have been given to everybody as a sheet of numbers. And we are often in this position as we communicate, right? Send an email, few stats. However, the Weather Channel took a data story and made it a Hollywood experience that anybody could understand from any walk of life. And I want to talk a little bit about how they made this happen. But this is my premise for today, that Unreal Engine and real-time game engines like it make it possible for us as storytellers to more effectively communicate our work than has ever before been possible. And I'll go out further to say that as popular as applications like PowerPoint and Keynote are today or Google Slides for creating presentations, that in the career space of everybody on this call, Unreal Engine will become as common as PowerPoint for delivering presentations. And that may seem crazy given the level of complexity that's on display here. But over the next 10 years, with the explosion of tools that are happening, if you are in a position of talking about policy or change, it will be an almost certainty that engines like Unreal and Unity will be a part of that storytelling discussion. So there are three major themes under the use of Unreal Engine as a storytelling device that I want to talk about. Here's why it's possible today. It is free to use by Unreal Engine. If you go to unrealengine.com right now, all of us in the room, depending on what computers you have access to, you have access to the basic technology. So the reason this is relevant today is one, it is free. Two, it is real time. So whereas 20 years ago, it is thousands of hours to animate a film like Pixar's um, Up or Toy Story, 
the premise with something like Unreal Engine, which is real-time visualization, is that there is no render time. That you, and when you're making the story, can watch your story unfold in real time. And that when you want to tell your story, you deliver it in real time. And that's the engine of Unreal Engine. And then the final part of my three statements here is that Unreal Engine is an ecosystem. There is a 100,000 plus developer community of artists and programmers who are working to create the plugins that scientists and engineers, policymakers like are on this Zoom call together will use to tell their stories. And those three elements have only come together recently to be true. This was not true five years ago, but today it is free. It is uh, part of an ecosystem and it is real time. And that's gonna become part of the story that we talk about today. First of all though, um, and you can use the hand raising function if you want. I'm curious, those on the call, how many of you saw or heard about the Weather Channel visualization when it came out? Uh, I'll raise my hand as a fellow geek. Okay. So this is interesting that this was a profound advancement in policy storytelling and it snuck up behind out of anybody's awareness when they least expected it through the weather channel of all things, which nobody would call an exciting watching experience until recently when they started doing this. So um, this was a question that just came up in chat so Unreal Engines basically translate the number to meaningful visualization, which a user creates using the ecosystem. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the parts here. So let's talk about what Unreal Engine and resources like them allow you to do. Unreal Engine is a piece of software. It's an authoring software. The ecosystem includes things like the marketplace where you can go to download elements for use in the software. And it also includes developers worldwide who can program inside the engine. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more amongst some of these examples, but let me bring this to life for a moment. I'm gonna share my screen again, and I'm gonna go back to Google Chrome here. And I actually want to talk a little bit about the weather channel behind the scenes. So all of these case studies and everything that I'm presenting to today um, is linkable through unrealengine.com. And I'll follow up with Todd uh, with some links for everyone on this call in case you want to do more exploring. What, weather, what the Weather Channel did in order to improve their storytelling capabilities is they, in the last decade, began to invest in real-time storytelling technology. And in this case study, they basically took a giant green screen stage and reimagined how they're going to tell their weather stories. So I'm going to scroll down here. So whether they're presenting the classic tropical downpour weather forecast, or they're talking about global winds, heat change, that's all being done on a green screen stage and they are broadcasting that in real time. This, and again, my goal is not for you to be able to program an Unreal Engine by the end of this discussion, but for you to think in terms of real time visualization engines as allowing you to tell stories in a way that you never have. And then where you go from there, the possibilities are truly infinite. So the typical workflow is that you would create your background animations, et cetera, that are fed by the data from your reports or analysis. It then gets output into a series of playback devices and hardware in the studio. The real-time cameras that I'm circling here bring your foreground talent into it. And then all of that is brought together in a final broadcast like we saw to kick off this discussion. Now, again, there are a lot of moving parts there, but a, the last 10 years has seen a sea change in what's possible in order to delight, inspire, and really engage your audience in a way that only a big visual effects film could in the past. So the Weather Channel has really captured the imagination, I think, for taking what could have been, as I said, an Excel sheet of 20 salient data points and making it into something that everyone can understand and appreciate. I wanna to go to a completely different discussion though for a moment. And I wanna talk a little bit about visualizing in terms of something um, much more targeted. 
So let's say that you're involved with a city and you are maybe looking at uh, the impact of a particular construction project on neighboring green spaces, or you want to get a sense of how long construction will take or what the uh, impact will be on surrounding areas. Again, Unreal Engine can come into play and has come into play. That's the other thing I should say. Anything I talk about today is not theoretical. It's being used by somebody somewhere on the planet. So I'm going to show you one more example of this type of visualization in play today. And then I'd like to take a moment to check in with you. So stand by, I'm going to share my screen once again for another case study at unrealengine.com. Again, my role here today is as an ombudsman slash guide to expose you to some thoughtful applications that may be relevant to your own world. So there is a group called Terenz. They are based in Sweden and they are an urban design and visualization firm that works with cities to visualize their upcoming urban development before they actually execute. So what I wanna do is introduce you to some of the visualization images that they put out in the world. So before they actually execute a project, they use a modification of Unreal Engine they've created called Tier Engine to imagine the space where they wanna develop ahead of time. So these are all generated from Unreal Engine and we can go photorealistic or we can take it all the way back to planar forms and truly simplify a given project. So what they will do is take a look at all of the perspectives for a given development project well ahead of the first um, shovel hitting the dirt so that all of the stakeholders can be brought on to analyze the impact of a project. So pretty pictures all generated from Unreal Engine. Where I got really excited was when I saw what they did, you see solar and shade studies, visualizing underground objects and how they interact. But where I got excited was a project where they were looking at a new crosslink highway update. And what I wanna show you is again, using Unreal Engine, uh, I wanna to scroll to a um, place a little bit further in their video. This is where they took part of the Unreal Engine functionality and they made it easier to visualize what would happen to the overpass in real time before they begin constructing it. So I'm gonna play from this point. There's no sound on this video. So what I'll do is I'll narrate. This is an iPad looking on Unreal Engine in real time. So it allows somebody to walk around and using GIS integration, they're able to turn on and off different viewpoints for any given date and time. And this is the other key component to understand about Unreal Engine. It's not just a visualization system. It doesn't just let you put in pretty pictures. It also has a physics engine, previously only available to high-end visual effects houses for the blockbuster movies of the year. This allows you in real time for any day and time to imagine where the sun is going to be, to take a look at weather. And of course, this type of interaction with the environment is essential to understand for the surrounding areas. You can easily imagine adding climate data into this experience. You could easily imagine adding traffic flows into this experience. You could also look at animal crossing data for something like this kind of overpass. Imagine bringing this all together in a compelling story where you want people to imagine in real time what the project would look like. I'd wanna stop here for a moment, given these two examples, and I want to hear from you. I want to hear the first thing that pops into your head about how you might imagine this type of high fidelity, real time visualization. There are no wrong answers here. It's not something you have to be working on right now, but I'd love to hear the ideas that this inspires you for and give a little bit of real time feedback on it. Um, so Jim, you have your camera on. Uh, I know that you're you're a part of the, the student body. So thank you for leaving your camera on. Um, what is the first thing that you imagine um, telling the story with, with this kind of, of tool? How would you transform something you're thinking about for the future? You know, first off, Stephen, uh, thank you for sharing this. This is incredible. Um, so my, my first reaction is actually a question. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in cyberspace policy and the visualizations here, you know, space and place is, is key and central. And 
So my question is, you know, how might we use something like this to visualize activities in, in cyberspace? I can imagine it's possible. It's going to take some creative thinking, um, but that's where that's where my mind is heading. So I would actually amplify that with cyberspace can range from who has access to it, right? Which in Africa, as we all know, the very access to cyberspace is a real concern right now. So you might visualize to start with laying cyberspace over a map of the earth and understanding geopolitically who can even access it. So there may be something useful to do just off the top of my head where you have the beltway in DC with an amazing access point and lines going out from there to other parts of the world. My wife who's involved in global conservation policy, one of the concerns she has for any major event this past pandemic year is they asked for people to attend virtually, but many of the stakeholders in African countries don't have access to the internet infrastructure that allowed them to attend virtually. So this is a very current discussion. And I would just offer that as a, as a, as a global amplification of what you're discussing. Stephen, did you have something you wanted to mention? Yeah, I can give you a very concrete example. I was involved in a project that was actually terminated early for political reasons but it was in Mexico where they had broken up the, uh, the monopoly of the, um, the major petroleum uh, company there. And we were actually building a decision theater that would bring different groups of players, stakeholders, government officials, and so on into a space, an imagined space where they could visualize different architectures at different levels of what the national pipeline system and uh, upstream and downstream relationships between players in the uh, petroleum and petrochemical um, industry could be uh, with a, a view towards thinking about different architectures and finding kind of a robust configuration for how Mexico could go forward meeting various you know policy objectives at the national so visualizing all of those players in a meaningful way so that everyone can see in one area and taking them on as layers of visualization you can now apply this i'm going to show a gis integration tool after this check-in but annie let's take one more something this just comes to your head right away even in these couple of quick examples yeah um thank you so i'm so jazzed about this because i think if there's like for vulnerable populations where people don't really understand what they're going through, like um, homeless populations, domestic violence uh, victims. And I see a lot of a lot of ways that this is gonna be, or I would like to use this in terms of like, you know, giving kind of like a eagle eye view of someone else's life. So thank you. Uh, I, I love that a lot because it puts the human element back into it. My first two examples didn't really include any humans. I wanna show everyone um, a data integration tool that I think you'll find interesting from your perspective. So again, this is part of my ecosystem theme where you don't have to do this alone. So I'm gonna reshare into my Google here and I want to go to, um, I think it's Terraform here. So Terraform is a GIS integration tool, again, it's most exciting for me when we don't have to actually be programmers. Well, that certainly helps that we don't have to be computer scientists to tell these stories. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this demo video. Um, this is one of many uh, firms that work with the Unreal Engine for building tools. And this GIS tool is designed, and I'm gonna narrate here, to take real world to GIS to data um, that you guys see a lot in your, in your research you can take those real-time GIS figures, pull them into Unreal Engine, and create terrain based on that. So let's say you're doing a study in Mexico and you want to look at petroleum routes and who it's going to affect. You can actually get terrain, elevation, city data, et cetera, and turn on and off those layers. So you're not having to create a world from scratch inside of Unreal. You're using a lot of smart tools to bring those measurements together. So one very specific example of this, uh, let me go. This actually I don't have a film for, but it reminds me of some of these notes here. So this is a South African project from Common. And what Common did is they created a map in Unreal Engine 
And then they put an icon for each renal care facility in the area. They were then able to look at market information for who had access based on a real terrain with real population information. So one easy application to imagine here is where would you put a new renal facility that could actually help people with dialysis um, based against those who need it. So let me stop there a moment because that's kind of the next stage of this discussion. The ecosystem is plugging in. So I see T. Marler has a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. So first of all, this is really um, just the, the discussion of the, the Weather Channel video has set off a lot of light bulbs that uh, I, I think others at RAND would, would appreciate, uh, you know, if nothing else, demonstrating why the Tech and Narrative Lab. But um, a question I had was, even if we look at PowerPoint, uh, if you want to go beyond just text on your slide and do something that's really nice, one, many people don't have an inclination to do that. Two, it can take hours to put together 10 slides. Um, so how easy is this to do really? Unreal, my understanding is, is might have a steeper learning curve than something like Unity. There are other, open, like an Ogre, or we used to use Virtuals when that existed. Um, is, is, is Unreal the only uh, one that captures those three aspects that you mentioned, or are you more advocating just for using game engines in general, and there are many options out there? Is there something special about Unreal? <clears throat> You're so unreal. unreal is special because right out of the gate, um, when wanted people to have more access, it made it free to use. Unity has since followed, but you're absolutely free. right. The idea here is real-time game engines. From my own perspective, as not affiliated with Unreal, but a real-time user of Unreal, is that it has provided the most resources and has the greatest global ecosystem of tools. Got it. I will say to be very clear for everyone on the call, your experience in the next five years is that there will be a person on the team who is game engine proficient. That is gonna become an important part of any storytelling team for policy. The thing that's gonna make it possible for us to all use this without being computer scientists are those plugins. For instance, if you were to search for data visualization inside of Unreal Engine, you'll very quickly see tutorials pop up on how to take an Excel spreadsheet and plug it in for visualization. So. It is a time commitment. Maybe it's not used lightly, but it's certainly worth considering rather than just a, a report of the big binder with the printout of the final RAND analysis, for instance. <laughs> what if hand in hand with that was an unreal presentation that is in the neighborhood of the Weather Channel? Doesn't have to look like that, but, but the biggest thing that I'm throwing out for the group is asking the question of, what would the analysis look like if we paired it with a real-time engine presentation? And I Got think it. that's where it can be Thank quite you. exciting. So maybe it's an end part of the process. We have one more hand up from SCHOWDHU. Oh yeah, I just wanted to like, uh, when you ask a question, like where do you see uh, using it? I was just imagining like whether this would be a good tool to uh, quantify the effects of the voter suppression laws which are coming uh, up recently in a couple of states, like how how would closing up one poll center reduce the amount of vote in different years, in the past years, in the future years, something like that? Do you think it would be an appropriate use for something like this? Um, change over time, anything related to geography, all of that links together through this type of storytelling approach. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left in this discussion and I want to introduce everyone to a few more ideas here. Again, the most basic integration. By the way, the reason I asked everyone what is their experience with video games is I wanted to make sure everyone had at least a passing familiarity. The most interesting thing about video games is you don't wait for something to render. You don't wait for the room that you want to walk into to suddenly have to draw on screen. And that real-time immediacy, that excitement that you get from the video game, my, my big message about video games today is video game expectations, video game manipulation, where you can move through space and get real-time satisfaction. In essence, that's what we're talking about here. Because these 
Unreal and Unity started as game engines meant to deliver real-time experiences, that's the power we're talking about adding to our stories as policymakers, right? Or data visualizers is that we can take almost like um, offshoots of the Apollo space program. These are offshoots of a technology that when they first created Unreal for the Unreal game, they had no idea that 20 years later, it would become a worldwide phenomenon. So that's part of the reason for the excitement. So I'm gonna to go to the final chapter of my sharing here. And I want to now talk about the ecosystem just a little bit. And this is just as powerful as any of the specific examples. So for anybody who is wanting to learn Unreal Engine, uh, expand it here. So for anybody who's wanting to learn Unreal Engine, uh, you would download the Epic Games launcher from Epic Games. It is a higher learning bar than Excel or PowerPoint or your average game. But I think that for anybody on this call, even looking at tutorials would yield you dividends in terms of possibilities, because many of you will be in a position where you might bring on somebody who uses Unreal Engine or Unity Engine in the future. So here's the powerful thing. Unreal Engine, as I said, is free to use. And then once you go into the Unreal Engine interface, and it works the same way on Mac or PC, although more people use it on PC because it tends to work a little better. Um, your first experience is an announcement, just like any set of web page experiences you might imagine. If you were on the front page of BBC, there are little articles. If you go into learning tab here, there are hundreds of hours of tutorials and pretty much any topic you could imagine. So there's a quick start to even what Unreal Engine is. In less than an hour, you can get a basic idea of what it is. And you may not actually ever open up the software, but you can at least learn. But let's say that you've heard about how um, Unreal Engine allows you to configure possibilities, that you have a set of options that you want to display. Well, the car configurator may not be exactly what you want to experience, but it may have a functionality that you want to use elsewhere. And so this particular tutorial is how car companies are using Unreal Engine to showcase design changes in real time and to put their vehicles in type of, inside of an environment. But I'm gonna go all the way out to an edge case here. Imagine if you were designing um, an expansion of services in Sub-Saharan Africa. You could easily imagine this landscape now being that village in real time and imagining where you want to put wells in. And the same type of manipulation that you're seeing here for a high-end car, you could begin to imagine infrastructure changes uh, at a remote place in the world. Again, just brainstorming right off the cuff on that. Part of the ecosystem that I think is really amazing is the marketplace. Now, the marketplace allows you to tap into hundreds of thousands of pre-existing assets that are not thousands of dollars, but tens of dollars. So let's say that I wanted to tell a story in a city. Well, I would go to the search box here and I would just type in city. And these are pre-made cities. So let's say that I wanted to tell the story of a modern city set of streets and I wanted to design something. Well, for $30, I can download a pre-built city that contains alleys, basic streets, basic residences. And then imagine if we download this, again, $30 just to open it up. And after a week of training, anybody on this call could then fly a camera through and begin to put objects in this city. Now take that GIS integrated tool that I talked about earlier, and now you can begin to add real-time geographic information into this. You can start to bring data flows into it in an interesting way. And then rather than spending $10,000 or $100,000 for a solution, you're putting this $30 city set on the free Unreal Engine to get started. And uh, again, this is something because it's free, I would encourage everyone on the call to uh, explore and get an idea of what's possible. Maybe you don't have the resources on your team today, but certainly in the future, this is something you want to start thinking about. So uh, let me stop again one more time there. And that was a discussion of the ecosystem and some of the resources that are possible there. Um, what are some of the questions? Uh, let's take a few questions now that come up. 
What are you inspired to do with this? What, what is your next thought in this discussion? So Stephen, can I, can I ask you a couple of broad questions relating Please. to this? So um, I remember when, when I worked for the Dean of the film school at USC and iMovie came out, her comment was, well, it's, it's awesome, but it's not gonna instantly create a million Steven Spielbergs. So can you talk a little bit about the art of filmmaking and in this case, it's experience making um, and, and sort of what people need to be thinking about to, because it's a, it's a very different, to me, it's a very different set of skills that you have to be willing to be uncomfortable with and sort of learn to help to build both narrative for a flat screen and now in a three-dimensional experience. So taking it to, as Todd requested, a 30,000 foot view or international students, a 30,000 kilometer view, um, why, why is Unreal important for storytelling based on the work that you do? How would you even engage with it? Well, Unreal starts tabula rasa. It is simply a tool that's looking for a story. And that's actually what I would say all of you bring in your work is you have the information, you have the finding, but that's only part of the story. How do you actually share this finding with the audience in a way that the finding will mean something to them and empower them to act on the finding? And I would answer from that 30,000 kilometer view in this way. Unreal Engine allows you to create a highly watchable, impactful, meaningful, and inspiring translation of your results in much the same way that the Weather Channel example did at the beginning. So if you want to ask the central question, it is, what is the story you want to tell? And we ask that every single day. To Todd's point, 20 years ago, the best way to think about this might have been, okay, let's use iMovie to put together a little film uh, that could bring all the information together in a compelling way. Now that we've come to 2021, what story do I want to tell? The answer might be that the best way to tell that story is through Unreal Engine, where the beginning, middle, and end of any good story might look like this. It might be, to take the South African example, it might be that we have a challenge and that we've got resources for additional renal care facilities. So we might actually tell the story first by bringing up a map showing the diverse terrain of South Africa in this case. We might tell the story of the population first. So we set context. Then we talk about our challenge and we identify the number of population that actually needs access to renal care. Then we showcase the places where those renal care facilities currently are. And finally, highlight where renal care facilities should be. Bonus, now we can actually dive into that map in real time, see the terribly road that leads us to a renal care facility in the back country. So we can understand without actually having to travel there, what that challenge is just to get access to the resources. So in demonstrating that, again, off the cuff example, I'm trying to say as a storyteller where Unreal Engine can make the data, the report that I'm sharing more accessible. Um, so Todd, does that kind of get at a starting point of how I as a, as a storyteller might want to use Unreal for this type of work? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, that we've had a little bit going back and forth in chat. Um, I, I think for me, our, our goal will be to just start using it right? And, and just learn by doing and prototyping things, because I think that we can bring that there are some things that are a, that are a fairly clear cut one to one translation, right? If I have a particular geo specific area or geotypical area, and I, I can create that. And if we're looking about change of time, I can do those things. There are things I can do in engine that sliders and whatnot. Absolutely. Getting back to Jim's question about cyberspace, I think one of the most 
things that is most tantalizing to me is how do we visualize the unvisual data because that now th this i think and games actually point us that way because games have been doing some games have been doing that for a long time right showing shot trajectories and other things that you don't actually see so i you know for it's easy for me because you're preaching to the choir on the game engine will be the next powerpoint seeing the tie-in of the gis tools um is a big deal um this whole idea of geospecific versus geotypical is also going to be another issue that we're going to need to crack because i think this the marketplace my sense is that most of those are geotypical and if you're talking about a policy thing oftentimes they will want geospecific so crossing that bridge but but it can be done i mean if we can do gis integration then it can all be done i think the the challenge is getting over the idea that the game engines are impossible to use which 10 years ago they were unless you were my son who's a game programmer right and i'm seeing that in just the last couple of years todd that the plugins that take an excel sheet of data or that take the gis data that you already have access to and say okay enter that now it's an interface thing to the engine as a whole if people had one thing that they wanted to try it would be that front page tutorial on introduction to unreal engine which at its heart is starts with a gray infinite space and it says okay what would you like to pull into this space maybe it's a city maybe it's it's a single village hut somewhere in a developing nation and you want people to understand how many people live in that hut so you might start with the hut and then begin putting people into it or you might have a much larger story and you can bring in a pre-made globe and you want to start talking about oceans rising at different places in the globe and all of those starting points are the low-hanging fruit because it involves taking a pre-made model dropping it into the space and then beginning to look at it in interesting ways and that's the entry point and getting that kind of familiarity which over a series of tutorials during the course of a week you can learn how to load the engine load models for low cost or free and begin to getting a sense of putting your camera to look at parts of those models that would be an entry starting point where even if you never went further, it would get you understanding 80% of the possibilities that you need to know about as somebody who might manage a team with those folks. I see Tim's got a question. Could you just real quickly, 60 seconds, give an idea for how game engines and previs have are completely transforming Hollywood and entertainment? Yeah, let me do this. Um, actually, I'm, I will I will end on that note because actually that was something I pulled up. Uh, T. Marler, you had a question. I'm more of a, a con a comment in the vein of the discussion, but if you've got something yeah, you want to sure touch on before we run out of time, have at it. Okay, great. I'm going to share, I'm going to share one more time here, and I want to give a best in class Hollywood experience and. This project is called Rebirth, and it lit the world on fire in 2019 when it came out. I'm going to play just a little bit of it to get started here. Adaptation, the ability to learn from past experience, the use of knowledge to alter their environment. These virtues defined our creators and drove them to the brink of destruction. But we cannot exist without them. We must so I want to stop for a moment before I play a quick 30 seconds of behind the scenes. Unreal Engine, using its massive resources, bought the world's top 
photorealistic house called Quixel, who sent teams around the world to photo capture millions of pieces of geography, fine art, et cetera. So every image that you saw there was in the Unreal Engine, was rendered in real time, and is based on real world objects. And let me give you a quick taste of the behind the scenes on how they pre-visualized that. So every object that you saw there was a three-dimensional captured object we also that could be manipulated. So every element of this landscape, which is based on an Iceland scanning trip that they did, is something they were able to manipulate in real time. They started with an artist concept sketch, which is what you're seeing here. And then they didn't animate so much as they took from a million object library of rocks, et cetera, which is free to use. This is the bonkers part. If you're not actually making a game, you can use this for free. Each of the elements that the artist visualized, they then created in real time using objects like this. So every rock face, every aspect of the terrain, they were able to manipulate in real time and then take the sun, set it overhead, add grasses, set the wind speed, add atmosphere, and then in real time, tell a story whatever direction they wanted to. And this incredible piece, it's one of the links that I'll give to Todd, the author says something quite beautiful, and I think it fits nicely with our discussion here today. Every object has a story. So every rock uh, based on lava and that geological expansion has a story and how those elements are put together contribute to a larger story. And then those groups of elements create the whole story. And if I were to summarize our discussion today, it is that Unreal Engine allows us access to story building blocks that we've never been able to manipulate before at our level as individual storytellers and teams of policymakers. So that is my presentation, a quick introduction to Unreal uh, from the perspective of how it might change our storytelling in the future. Todd, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Steve and I, I suspect this won't be the last conversation we've had. There's been a little bit in chat um, and we've, Rand has done some game engine stuff. I know there was kicking around with Unity um, and there was a, a Unity versus Unreal thing. My, my son has been increasingly using Unreal um, and he did previs. Uh, he was building previs tools for a while uh, at a studio. So uh, I think there's already interest and um, I, I think we're going to start an Unreal group in the lab and just start building stuff. Uh, I didn't and realize the right there was a, I didn't realize there was a GIS plugin. Um, Cord Thomas, who was on the call earlier, is a GIS guy from way back. And so um, you know, this landscape has changed so much in the last five years. It's, it's really mind boggling. Todd, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure to speak to all of you. I'm excited to be part of the discussion and to see where all of you take this as a next step in your storytelling. Mm -hmm.